Hello, everyone. Hello from Weiser Hall, actually. This is the uh, first hybrid uh, of the, uh, not this year, but I guess the, um, since you know, the pandemic started uh, for this series. Uh, so we wish to welcome you to the first presentation, um, as I said, of the noon lecture series of the Liverpool Rogo Center for Chinese Studies for winter term 2022. The complete series schedule is available on the uh, China Center's website and email reminders are sent out weekly. For those of you who are attending through Zoom, please feel free to submit any questions you have for Dr. Peck through the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We will address as many uh, of your questions as we can within the time allotted. We begin with an announcement. The next presentation is the Winter 2022 uh, LRCCS Noon Lecture Series. Uh, will take place on Tuesday, February 1st, and will be given by Yu Jie Wong Yang, um, Teaching Assistant Professor of Political Science, University of Illinois at Urban Champaign, who will be speaking on Bring Your Own Workers, Chinese OFDI, or Outward Foreign Direct Investment, Chinese Overseas Workers, and Collective Labor Rights in Africa. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Richard Pegg. Dr. Pegg is director and curator of Asian art at the McLean Collection in Chicago. The McLean Collection is a private museum uh, constituted of the Asian Art Museum and the MAP Library. Um, he joined there as the Asian Art Curator in 2004, and since 2014, he is the director. During the 18 years there, he greatly contributed to form one of the best private, uh, private collections of maps in the world and a hub of map research, leading a scholarly uh, residency and publication program. Dr. Pegg received BA and MA degrees in Chinese literature from George Washington University and MA and PhD degrees in East Asian art history from Columbia University. He has worked in major institutions in New York, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Asian Soci Asia Society Museum. He has also taught East Asian uh, art history courses at New York University and Wake Forest University. He has an extensive list of publications, which shows his wide range of expertise, not only in Asian maps, but also in Asian uh, paintings, ceramic Chinese bronzes, and other artistic traditions, including the McLean Collection, uh, Chinese ritual bronzes in 2010, and cartographic traditions in East Asian maps in 2014. He has two book projects forthcoming, the McLean Collection, Early to Mid uh, Medieval Chinese Pottery, which will be published this year, and the Blue Maps of China. I believe some of the findings he will talk today will be included in his book. Dr. Pegg is also instrumental in creating a network of Asian art museum curators. He has served as a steering committee member of the uh, American Curators of Asian Art, an organization of Asian art curators in North America. I first met Dr. Pegg uh, during a museum curator workshop held in Korea in 2009. It was one of the first professional meetings for me as a newly appointed curator uh, of Asian art at UMA since he has researched Ming Dynasty painter Shen Maoye's masterwork, The Orchid Pavilion Gathering, in the collection of UMA. And since I was also from a Midwestern institution, uh, we have many topics, topics to share. He's also a master of Tai Chi uh, and told me and other curators' movements on the rooftop garden of a Seoul hotel. Over many years, uh, Dr. Pegg has remained a good friend and inspiring colleague to me. Today, Dr. Pegg will talk on blue printed maps produced in the early 19th century. One of these maps from the McLean collection, uh, mounted as a folded screen, is currently under conservation by Chang He, uh, the East Asian painting conservator at UMA. This talk is being co-sponsored by the University of Michigan Museum of Art. Please welcome Dr. Pegg.
Thank you, Natsu, and uh, thank you, the Center for China Studies, for inviting me to uh, have the opportunity to share some of my research uh, about the blue maps of China. Um, this is maybe my third or fourth hybrid. So this whole, you kind of, when you're in Zoom mode, you know, you're like sitting by yourself wherever you are and you're not really thinking about it. So it's, it's, it's always kind of wonderful to have, it's not like there's a full audience here, there's like six people. But um, th this uh, ability to experience both at the same time is kind of a surreal uh, in and out. Um, I'd uh, also like to thank um, uh, the, uh, just do a shout out to the horn section of the Michigan Marching Band. Uh, my daughter is a freshman here this year. I have my Michigan button on along with my uh, McLean pin. So uh, um, I told her I would embarrass her in front of all of these people since she's not at home anymore for me to do that on a regular basis. So uh, she is cursing me right now somewhere on campus. So uh, with, with that said, um, I'd like to begin the introduction with a little bit of the story about how I got involved with these maps, uh, what sort of piqued my interest. Um, and this begins with this screen, uh, uh, this blue map, this Chinese blue map that is mounted as a screen that I acquired during Asia Week in 2005 in New York. Uh, saw it on view, wasn't quite sure what it was, price point was relatively inexpensive, uh, but it really intrigued me as a specialist of uh, East Asian painting and having uh, begun to think about East Asian maps uh, that were in the McLean collection, not to mention that there's an Asian art museum and then the separate map library. And I didn't really start to consider uh, maps per se of East Asia until the map curators started bringing them to me as they were to be cataloged into the database. And so this was sort of the beginning of these notions of thinking about maps as a painting specialist, someone who thinks about the depiction of uh, the three-dimensional world in two dimensions. It was something I was already sort of familiar with. So it's sort of this transition into uh, maps and map making traditions in some ways was a very easy one given my, given my background. So uh, in 2014, I published this book, the first book of its kind, looking at East Asia as a region and cartographic traditions. There are lots of books about Chinese maps, lots of books about Korean maps and Japanese maps, but no sort of overview that considers all three regionally and things that are characteristic of East Asian mapping as opposed to the, the rest of mapping traditions around the world. So that book actually sort of represents for me kind of a primer, uh, my first step into it. I think now, almost 10 years later, I would rewrite the entire book. Uh, anybody who's an author who publishes scholarly work like that has the same kinds of uh, issues. It would probably be instead of 150 pages, more like 550 pages at this point. But we acquired it 2005, almost immediately brought it back to the museum, unpacked it, and Mrs. McLean, remember this is all a private collection, loved the color. She said, that has to go into my apartment in downtown Chicago. And so I got to look at the, view, uh, the map in person, in our building, for maybe two days before it was gone and permanently uh, on, on, on view in their apartment downtown, the Park Hyatt in downtown Chicago. They sold that space in 2019. And so I was able to bring it back um, over the course of time and probably before we, we hung it up, uh, the hinges on it had started to fail. And so I show you here, uh, on the left side you can see where the paper has started to wear and break down on these hinges. And so I wanted to take the opportunity, uh, the UMMA, the UMA, as, as Natsu calls it, the University of Michigan Museum of Art, um, 
has a paper conservation, East Asian Paper Conservation Lab on site. It's in the Midwest. It's a four hour drive relatively. Typically, we would have to send things to East Coast, West Coast if East Asian uh, paintings. And so this was a great opportunity for me to have that repaired. In addition, uh, when it was last mounted, uh, it was mounted onto a gray paper. And so you'll see where there are losses. The gray paper is, uh, remains there. And so I also saw this as an opportunity to inpaint that, not to make it look like it was part of the map, but to make the gray paper less obvious when you look at it as an overall visual presentation. It's a very standard thing to do when uh, doing restoration for uh, paintings of any kind. And so off it came. Uh, at this point, almost, uh, let's see, two years and three months ago, uh, we delivered in November 2019. They were supposed to start work in February 2020. It got bumped for various other projects to April of 2020. March 2020, the universe shut down. Well, not the universe, but certainly this planet shut down. And so the blue map sat in quarantine uh, in the basement. No one allowed in the building. No one allowed to do anything. Um, and so we were not able to progress until maybe eight months ago when things started to reopen. Uh, Chen He got access. You see him standing here, the picture on the right. Uh, that's Chen He, the conservator. That's obviously uh, me on the left. This is Natsu, who's just introduced us uh, today. Standing over, you can see uh, the map, and we've begun to deconstruct uh, the mount to see how it was constructed. I wanted some information. This was an opportunity to kind of take it apart a little bit um, because the, the way it was mounted, there was something different about it. Didn't know what that was, but this was an opportunity to, uh, to begin to think about it. The other person I wanted to just uh, shout out and thank was Katie Pritchard. I've put her name up here, the assistant registrar who's helped with the coordinating of all of this between Qian and Natsu and myself and logistics, getting things in, getting things out, getting me in to see the space, to see the various uh, uh, progress of the restoration of our, our map. So what's important to remember is that this terrestrial map is half of a pair. So the original project, when this was produced in the 19th century, and we'll talk about that in a moment, was a celestial map and a terrestrial map. This is a very standard practice in cartographic traditions for globes, uh, certainly starting from the late 16th through the 17th century, uh, but as well as for sheet maps, wall maps, large format maps like this, uh, quite often you will do a kind of heaven and earth as a set. Uh, and so this is something to keep in mind. So what I'm going to do now is sort of historicize the terrestrial map, since that's the focus of today's talk. But I'll also take a little bit of time at the end to talk about the celestial map, the combination of the two, and uh, what that's meant. Uh, because of the work we're doing here on ours, all of, during all of this time, since about COVID started, I've also been trying to get scientific pigment analysis done on the blue pigment itself. The first place to enable that was Harvard, uh, the Weissman Preservation Center, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, the in a moment. So we begin with the blue terrestrial maps, produced in two editions. Uh, this is how I'm separating them, uh, dated and undated, uh, and at least eight different states. This will become, the reasons for this will become more apparent as we talk about the actual production of it. Uh, but from about 1812 to about 1825 is this 12 to 13 year range uh, that I think that all of these terrestrial maps uh, were produced. So it starts with a, uh, a family of cartographers in the Qing Dynasty. The Kangxi Emperor, the second emperor of the uh, Qing Dynasty, starts in the 1660s up until the beginning uh, you know, into the third decade of the 17th century. He hires the Huang family to create a map of, um, I would call, the realm. 
it's not a map of the world per se. It's not to say that it doesn't have wor the world in its consideration, but this is a map of the realm, the sphere of influence of the Manchu Qing court. And so it has this very, uh, uh, the original map, this lofty title, just sort of simple, Yu Di Chuen Tu. We don't have any extant copies, but we know that he produced it in 1673. But for our story, it's his grandson, Huang Qian Ren, who creates in 1767 uh, a map called the Da Qing Wan Yan Yi Tong Tian Sha Chuen Tu, which is essentially the complete map of the great Qing unified Yi Tong one yen, everlasting in perpetuity, uh, tian sha, all under heaven. There's a very sort of common way to think uh, from a Chinese perspective of the world. Um, and so in 1767, he produces this map. You're looking at the copy that's in the Bodleian. Uh, you'll notice across the top that in seal script is that title that I've just read out to you. And then the map itself. It's a little difficult to see on that scale. It's not terribly big. It's maybe a meter square. I'll show you this example. It's in the National Academy of Sciences in Beijing, uh, which is colorized and at least gives you a little notion. Why was this map created? What was it about the Qianlong Emperor, uh, the time and place that, that he required his official family of map makers to make a new map of China? So between 1660 and 1760, historically, the sphere of influence of Qing China doubled. It's not to say that the geography doubled, but that the Qing Empire created relationships on the periphery, these frontier zones, that had taken 100 years to put together. Nurahachi, the founder of the Qing, uh, began this process negotiating with the various parts of Mongolia. There was an east, west, north, and south. Manchuria is where they were from. Uh, we have relationships with Tibet. We have relationships with Vietnam. All of the places that sort of border it today. What happens is, in 1759, the Qianlong Emperor creates what's still in existence today, Xinjiang, the new border. This is created. This is the final piece for this kind of periphery. And to celebrate that, he commissions this new map to be made. And so what you're looking at here in this map is essentially China proper here and the periphery as that's defined. And so that includes geopolitical entities that are involved in tribute. And so those are part of the frontier zones. Geophysical spaces and markers, still it's kind of difficult to read uh, given the fact that you're either looking at it on a small screen or in, in, in this space. So when, I, when, I, when we look at the blue map, which was produced after this map, it'll be a little easier to talk about exactly what's in the smaller map. So this map increases that map, which is about a meter square, by four times. So what's happened? What's been added? Essentially, all of this information in the middle, all of these what appear to be dots, Every one of those is a different shape, a circle, a square, a rectangle, a triangle, a rectangle with a triangle on top. All of those are dis different administrative units. So whether it's a prefecture or a capital city or a provincial, provincial seat, all of those different things are represented visually by the shape that's presented. So a thousand new toponyms have been added. The other information is exactly the same as the 1767 information. And on this scale, it's much easier to see. Like I said, we have geophysical things, like the desert. So you have the Gobi Desert that goes all the way across, the Taklaman Khan Desert, which goes into about a third of that area. Quite easy to see the Yellow River depicted here and the Yangtze River, two very important geophysical space dividers for traditional China. You have this entire area is all representative of water, including a bit of water, which is actually the North Atlantic, uh, up here in the top corner. So this is part of the periphery. So you have those geophysical borders. You have things like, let's get my cursor back over again. I know it's somewhere. Uh, we have the Great Wall, 
So a man-made structure. You've got the Willow Palisade, which is something that's created during the Manchu that sort of extends. The, the Great Wall ends at Shanghai Guan, this point where it enters into uh, the Bohai Sea, uh, the north part of uh, the Pacific. Um, and from that point, this Willow Palisade, which is uh, a kind of giant moat with willows along one wall that sort of divides Manchuria. This was an area during the Qing that Han Chinese were forbidden from going to, so it was, a, it was sort of uh, demarcated by this willow palisade. So you have two man-made markers. And then the geopolitical spaces we were talking about that are involved in tribute, you see this large cartouche here, this represents Korea. It's not the Korean Peninsula. It's kind of a text box that hangs in space. You've got Japan that has a kind of mixed relationship. It's not tributary per se during the Manchu, but it has a relationship. You've got Ryukyu. You've got Luzon, which is part of the Philippines. Over here, this text block is Annam, which is Vietnam. You've got a little piece over here, which is Siam. You've got this very interesting cartouche in the upper left, which is, in fact, Russia. And so Russia had, in the late 17th century, various set of treaties were established, also had a tribute relationship with the Qing court. And so what this map shows you is the administrative bodies in the center and this kind of periphery around it, controlled by all these different kinds of ways of thinking about the space and integrating them into a map. So that's what the big blue map is. Today's focus, that's my rather lengthy introduction, uh, um, is, is to talk about the materials and uh, the mounting. So something that's less well known is there is also a black version. The McLean collection, we're very lucky to have both, the blue and the black. Um, the blue examples, we have, uh, so my colleague, Elka Papalitsky, who's uh, a, a postdoc at KU Leuven in Belgium, uh, and I have located 38 copies of the blue map. I've seen maybe 20 of them. Uh, the other, others are, are digital copies. And so I show you uh, what 12 of those different copies look, look like. Uh, the thing I would ha have you note is you'll notice that the tones of the blue are all slightly different. And so that became apparent to me as I began to see more and more of them in person. My first assumption as digital images started to come in, they're not all shot under the same conditions, with the same camera, with the same color scale, etc. So you get variations between copies. The one copy that uh, really struck out was the one that's uh, in the, the British Library, which is this copy, which is really bright blue. I just point that out as a note. What I want to talk about now is the extant copies that we have were produced, mounted, so they're printed on a sheet of paper, and then they're mounted for presentation. In China, they're all mounted as hanging scrolls. So the original format, these are Chinese-made maps, printed, as we'll see, in the city of Suzhou, to be meant and meant to be mounted as hanging scrolls. They were immensely popular immediately in Japan. And when they went to Japan, very few of them were mounted as scrolls. They were mounted in the top left there, you see as screens, the McLean screen on the left, uh, the one to the right of that uh, just came up last year at uh, Sotheby's London. You see them as Fusuma, as sliding doors. This is a set that is, uh, was sold at Christie's a few years ago. And the other format in Japan is the tradi traditional sheet map method of folding with paper covers top and bottom. This is very standard for almost all sheet maps uh, in Japan. So this is a Chinese-made map with the eight sections mounted onto the back of a piece of paper that is then folded Japanese style with the covers. And so at the bottom left, you see the one that's in Leiden. And the one uh, on the bottom right, you see sort of unfolded in process, is in uh, the Harvard Genjing Library. So, so I notice that these two different method 
methods of mounting. And I begin to notice along the right side of the very first panel, so the example blown up on the left is the one in the McLean collection. There's this little strip of eight titles repeated. They're title slips. This is very unusual. This is, one of the, this is the first unusual thing about this map that we're going to point out, is that these title slips were integrated into the printing process. In other words, the makers of this took into consideration the mounting of these maps. These title slips printed would then be cut off, divided into eight sections. Remember, these are mounted as eight scrolls, and these are the slips to be mounted on the outside of the scroll. Very traditional thing in Chinese uh, hanging scrolls, hand scrolls, uh, all of these formats. Once it, when it's rolled up, you put a title slip on it, so that tells you what's inside uh, the, the scroll. Very unusual to see the process, the printing process includes something with a pre-made title slip. What's interesting about the mounting is, <clears throat> so this example is the British Library example, Chinese style mount, you'll notice You'll notice that the title slip is gone. The examples mounted in Japan, like ours, this first one, title slips are there. Mounted in Japan, title slip is there. Mounted in Japan, title slip is there. Each one of those is a different format. The folding screen, the sliding door, and the folded sheet map. The only one that's really strange is this one that's in Waseda University collection, where the title slip is cut off but it's mounted above the map. This is the strangest use of title slips I've ever seen in any context, China, Japan, or Korea. So we have these title slips that are included in the printing. That's unique. So like I said, October 20, I contacted Harvard. Uh, they said, yes, we have a copy of the blue map. At the time, I only knew of the one copy that was available that had been digitized online. Uh, I reached out to Harvard Yanjing Library, uh, Professor Ma, Xiaohe Ma, uh, who's uh, uh, based there. He's the chief Chinese, uh, 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 Chinese, uh, Chinese book librarian uh, at the Harvard Yanjing Library. Uh, I knew he had done color studies because he's done some work on the Dunhuang uh, astronomical charts that involved chemical analysis. He said, absolutely, we should do that but everything's on lockdown. So I waited, fade till April 2021, contact him again. He says, yes, let's do it. Annie Shi, who's the assistant there, we had a Zoom call. She said, oh, you know, we have a second copy. I said, what? Had no idea. So that's the folded one, mounted in Japan, that style. The other one is loose sheets, so unmounted. It's the only set of original printed unmounted scrolls I've found anywhere. They said, we would love to do the pigment analysis. They sent it over, that was on a Tuesday, sent it over to the Weissman Preservation Center where they have on-site uh, equipment to do spectral analysis, to, to do pigment analysis. All of these things can be done on-site. So lo and behold, and, she's, and the woman who's in charge, uh, 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 Deborah said to me, what are you looking for? I said, I suspect, because all along I had assumed these were printed using indigo. Indigo has been long used in China since the Tang Dynasty for illustrated Buddhist manuscripts, etc. So it's a well-known material. Creating blue indigo dyed paper is a, a thousand plus year old tradition in the early 19th century. I said, but I saw this copy in the British Library where the blue is so bright, it can't be indigo. Indigo simply can't get that bright. This has to be something else. So my first thought that it was azurite, this mineral that's used uh, in traditional Chinese painting, but it wasn't quite the same color. Azurite is kind of a, has a kind of duller uh, quality to it. So remember, I sent it on a Tuesday, that Friday. I was supposed to have a Zoom call with the Weissman Center to talk about what the blue maps are and what I think. So Wednesday. She took the maps out. She got so excited by her initial spectral analysis, she went and bought, she went out to an art shop, bought a Prussian blue so she could do a side-by-side -side comparison. It turns out they are 100%, every single part of it produced in Prussian blue. This is unique 
object or point about these maps. Number two, this is major. The use of Prussian blue in East Asia, we're all familiar with it from the Japanese woodblock print artists working in the 1830s and 1840s. Uh, Hokusai uh, creates these blue series. These are very well known. This is 20 years earlier, the use of Prussian blue, which began, so I began to think about where was Prussian blue made. It's made in, it's invented or discovered in Europe, um, and it's actually imported by the British East India Company in the 1790s, but it turns out it begins to be produced in the first decade in Guangzhou in China proper, so you have a local source for it. There's still some debate about the Prussian blue that the Japanese were using. Is that Chinese made, because it's coming from China, or was it British or European made, imported into Canton, and then exported into Japan? These are all questions we may never be able to uh, locate exactly uh, the source material, but we have confirmed that it's Prussian blue. This is a major historical discovery. And the scale of it, these are 10 feet wide, five feet tall, all in Prussian blue. The scale of it, the expense, this is, this is uh, just uh, so interesting. It, you can see I get excited about it, I'm still excited about it. This has been going on for 10 years. The other thing that we discovered, and she discovered, is, and we had, and this was part of our Zoom conversation, and she, and she said, well, how are these printed? And I said, well, I, because on the black version, you can see uh, uh, the lines of a graining of wood. I said, they're woodblock printed. She said, but they're not woodblock printed. I said, but they are woodblock printed, and she said, but there's something very strange that we've discovered. And I said, well, what do you think has happened? She said, if you look under magnification, so what you're looking at here on the left is a shot taken uh, in the Weissman of the Harvard example. The shot you're looking at on the right with a very fancy camera and all sorts of stuff. The shots on the right are ones I took here at UMA in the lab with my cell phone. So you don't have the same magnification, but what I'm about to tell you will become apparent in both. She said, I think that these are positives of a positive. What that means is, in uh, those of you familiar with printmaking, you carve a woodblock print in the reverse. You ink the woodblock, and then you apply the paper under pressure. You peel it away, and on the paper is a positive. Very simple, anybody who's done even basic linoleum woodblock printing, you understand this principle. You carve in reverse, and what you get is a positive. So the negative and a positive. She said, this is a positive of a positive. And I said, how is that possible? She said, I don't know how that's possible. I said, what you're telling me is, essentially, you carve the woodblock in the positive, you apply the paper in the same way that you do for a traditional Chinese rubbing made from stone, where you moisten the paper, you press the paper down, and the places that are re in relief don't get inked. And then you ink on top. You peel the paper off, and you have a positive created from a positive. The only way to make a positive from a positive is in this rubbing style. How do we know that? What's the evidence for that? And that's what this detail shows us. When you look at the white areas, remember these are the areas that will be recessed. When you go and mount that, so in order to do that, you actually stretch the paper. So the paper has, in fact, stretch marks. When you flatten that, what, you, what will happen is, come on. What will happen is you will get creases like this, which is under high magnification, or like this. So that, that stretch mark has to go somewhere. So it just gets compressed and flattened, and so you get this kind of ridged space. When you look at our example, you can see all the creases. All of these lines are the creases from where the paper was stretched, and when it gets flattened, that stretch has to go somewhere. 
So we have, you have visual evidence. So the third unique aspect, we have title slips. We have printed impression blue. We have printed using a system I have never seen in East Asia for a map, for any other map. I am still waiting. I've, this is not the first time I've talked about this process. I'm still waiting for someone to say, oh, I found another map that's produced in this way in a Chinese context. Still hasn't happened yet. There's so many aspects to these maps that are unique uh, in terms of their production. And there's more. So uh, this is uh, We Fade. Uh, these are all photographs of the restoration process happening on our, our screen. So you see that new paper has been added. So you kind of lift this backing. You put in new paper. This is part of the old paper that will be replaced. And you see it's under pressure. And you see these little tabs that are being created. This is our map deconstructed here in the lab. Uh, hopefully it's progressed since then. That was about three months ago. Um, but like I said, what we, be, what we did on one corner was deconstruct it to see how it was all mounted together. I was very curious to see because the style of the mounting and the style of the wooden framing around it isn't Japanese. And we've confirmed it. It's Korean. So now all of my assumptions about this is what happens when it's mounted in Japan, and this is what happens when it's mounted in China. So this map was probably remounted 100 years ago under Japanese supervision in Korea, mounted using traditional Korean methods for mounting, but in the Japanese preferred style for mounting these. I haven't seen any other copies of these within a Korean context. And so uh, what's significant historically about that is this is when the Japanese are in Korea. And so 100 years ago, this, let's call it between 1910 and 1920s, uh, when this map was remounted within a Korean context. And so this adds an additional sort of twist and uh, 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 place for consideration for our actual uh, map. All of, these, all of this information is, is sort of uh, continues to be added together. The other thing that we were able to determine uh, here was that the paper that was used is Lianshir paper. So for much of uh, woodblock printing and traditional Chinese painting, Xuan paper, this mulberry-based paper, is the preferred for sort of high-end uh, production. Mulberry has a very long fiber uh, under uh, uh, microscopic examination. And so if you're using, uh, if you're taking paper for uh, stone rubbings, traditionally you don't use mulberry paper because the problem is that that long fiber, even though it has a high tensile strength, when you press and want to bend it, it will break. And instead of, instead of, instead of being able to bend the paper, you break the paper. And so the Lianshir paper is a bamboo-based paper. And bamboo fibers are very short. Bamboo, as we know, has 100 different uses. It's the only plant you can build with and eat with. That uh, this short, strong fiber easily bends and contours when, when manipulated like this. So the Lianshir paper is the paper that's developed for stone rubbings. So again, we have this process and this production method used for these blue maps that's unique to these blue maps. Nothing else like it uh, has, has been made. So that's about the ter terrestrial. I'm, I'm going to try and sum up. Uh, uh, I have to talk about the celestial maps because they're important in terms of who made these and where. So the celestial maps, four editions, three different authors. Uh, the first uh, edition has this uh, author, Yunyo uh, Sanren, which is just a nickname for the person who created the planisphere that you see inside there. Uh, this is a, a, a very famous uh, uh, cartographer, uh, Huang Shan, in the 1190s. That map is produced and then carved into stone, made into a stone stele uh, in the 1240s. 
I show you what the stele looks like. It's still there. It's in the Confucian temple in Suzhou. You can see it. It's accessible. You see the planisphere above it. You see a text below that talks about the movements of the planets, the sun, the moon, uh, the five known planets at the time, etc. Various types of celestial bodies, comets, things that, uh, that are uh, seen in the night sky. Uh, I sort of blow up. These are photographs I took several years ago. The map itself, the only difference between the blue map version is that the map itself is inverted. My guess is that's in deference to a uh, European perspective. The Chinese version, south is at the top, traditional Chinese cartography and uh, cosmology. South is at the top, north is at the bottom. This is a standard practice. And so probably in deference to European influence in the courts in the early 19th century, they've actually flipped the map. But the text that's around it is the same text that's on that stele. With the addition of more text. So I said that there's three different authors. The second author, we have no idea who he is. But this third author, Song Tao, is a historical person. Uh, there's, there's a description of, of, of who he is. But one of the things to note visually in the presentation is the fact that the first, on the far right, the title of this is given in seal script, like we saw at the top of the uh, 1767 map. Standard practice in map making to do it in seal script. The body of the text, the main text, is in standard script, kaishu. The final inscription on the final panel on the left is in clerical script. So to have an object, and uh, remember, uh, my background is in East Asian painting. To have an object that has clerical script, standard script, and seal script in a single object is highly, highly unusual. What kind of author would produce something like that? In addition, the dating for this, so if anybody's there out in the audience who's trying to read the date, it's on the final line on the far left side, I can guarantee you that you cannot do it because it uses three types of dating systems that are not your standard systems. In East Asia, we're used to a rain date and then a cyclical date under it, like in this case, this would be Jia Qing, uh, and maybe this is 26, so Jia Qing, fifth year, Etc. We're used to that kind of dating system. The dating system for this uses the Jupiter cycle. So the, the orbit of Jupiter takes 12 Earth years. And so that divides the heaven into 12 months. And so the months are determined by the Jupiter cycle. You have the Big Dipper cycle. Anybody who lives in the Northern Hemisphere, the Big Dipper is up there every night. And the handle of the Big Dipper appears to move 360 degrees through the course of the year. So the cyclical date is given on the apparent positions of the Big Dipper handle. That gives us our cyclical date. And then the day is actually uses the 28-day lunar cycle. And it's two days prior to the beginning of the first day of the lunar cycle. My undergrad, so uh, my major was Chinese, but I actually started a different university as an astrophysics major. So this was right up my alley. I couldn't have been more excited. And I have to say that the dating for this historically has been wrong for the last whatever number of years people have been translating this because they didn't understand the, the, that last day cycle. So I've corrected that. But what kind of person or group of people would produce something using three different kinds of seal script, using a printing methodology based on rubbings, using a material for pigment never used before. This has got to be a really interesting group of people. Creating title slips, so you're integrating the printing process and the mounting process in the production process. These are all sort of unheard of things in traditional practice. So it turns out that this particular fellow and I'm so glad that on the last version, 
of this. That's printed. He puts his name. He's involved in the collecting and involved in coteries in groups of poets, painters, scholars, who are all nuts for collecting traditional stone rubbings and uh, uh, rubbings from stone steelies and uh, from copy books. These are traditions that are begun 200 years earlier in the early 17th century. There's a group of calligraphers, and they begin to collect these things. They collect historical stone rubbings, the calligraphy on those, and then these traditional copy books, uh, the Tia books, that were begin to be produced in the Tang Dynasty, collecting Wang Shi Zhe's calligraphy, etc. So that kind of fades, but in the beginning of the 19th century, there's everybody is nuts. Every scholar is nuts for this stuff. So this is the kind of people that are doing it. On a number of the maps, the terrestrial maps, we have little inserts, like on ours, that give us clues that they're produced in the city of Suzhou, the traditional, historical, cultural capital of China. Some might argue still is one today, not maybe a major one, but still today. This is where scholars go. This is where new and innovative and interesting art is produced. This is where all of this group of people could have been together and have come together and created this, this uh, group of objects. The fact that they create a pair of them using this process, using this pigment, uh, the earliest use of Prussian blue, the only use of this method for production, no other map in East Asia. Forget about just East Asia. There is no blue map in any culture in the history of the world produced on this scale. It's the only map like it in the world. Just a little note. Some things, so we've, we've just published a chapter talking about some of this production and some of the research that we've done that'll be coming out this year. And then, as Natsu has already said, the Blue Maps of China book, hopefully will be out uh, sometime in 2023. Thank you. So those of you at home, that's a raucous, there's thousands of people here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Richard, for very rich, uh, both you know, visually, texturally, and many things. So thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions from this audience on site, yeah, um, in house certainly. Yeah, in house. Uh, I'll start, and I think uh, you have to use a mic. Um, When I saw the reproduction for the announcement, I didn't think very hard of it about exactly how it was printed. My assumption was actually that it had been with lighter ink on blue paper or backing, right? right. Which would make more sense. And then also, blue makes sense for <coughs> a celestial map much more, Qingtian and so forth. But why blue for the earthly map is another question. And I'm still not, and so, in a very simple kind of way, I've always thought of negative printing is when the outside is printed and the text is left free, which is, I guess, what we have here, right? Right. Because you're looking at the material behind that has not been carved away or whatever. Um, so I remain <coughs> a little unclear about why you do that, because it seems a lot of work, uh, and it's completely opposite. Uh, you see very small cartouches in black with the negative, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing on this kind of scale. Right. So those are the kind of questions or thoughts I have. Yeah, so, there, so there's a couple of issues there. What I haven't, didn't tease out is that I mentioned that for the terrestrial map that there are different editions. It's not just date, but in some cases you have uh, blue text on white, and in some cases white text on blue. In some cases you have a blue text in a white ground, in a blue field. So you have actually a number of combinations, and I think this goes again back to the fact that these are a bunch, this is a collective of uh, artists, practitioners, collectors who are thinking, how many different kinds of experiments can we come up with uh, to uh, sort of go through the whole range of 
if we could create a wish list of all the things that we would love to be able to do in a single map, let's do that. I mean, that's, I, I get this kind of feeling that these guys are just, the sky is the limit. So let's try, uh, do as many things as we can. The other thing that uh, when you're producing in this manner as a rubbing, every single addition is unique. So what I didn't, uh, again, what I didn't tease out, for example, where you saw the islands and groups of islands floating, if you look at the different additions, sometimes the islands are very dark and very tightly confined to the sort of perimeter. In other cases, and so that light blue is just a diluted Prussian blue. So you have these two tones. In some cases, it's kind of got a halo effect. In some cases, it's kind of irregular effect. So uh, in addition, every single copy is unique because each one is handmade. And so the, whatever the vat or mix of blue, it's fairly consistent through that, but the next one is slightly different. And, and you'll notice, and that was one of the other things that they noticed at Harvard was, they said this looks like it's been inked in the manner of a rubbing disc because you can see you layer, you know, you go over the same spot several times and you kind of work along uh, and create, and so it has spots where it's uneven under the microscope. To the eye, you don't, you don't see it. When you know to look for those kinds of things, or you look with a magnifier, you can see that. Um, so there's lots of really interesting things about this, and that whole process of positive and negative space, and how they intentionally play, play with it, is no question meant to be, like, meant to be playful, meant to be, well, let's, Let's do a white on, white on blue, and then let, let's switch it. Let's do the blue on white, carve another block. These are wood blocks. This isn't stone. So the, the process, wood block printing has existed for 1,500 years at this point. So, you know, you just need a nice, large plank. This, too, is unusual for wood block printing. But, I mean, these guys obviously had the resources, the ability, the, the, all of this uh, sort of all, all coalesce in, in these objects. That was a very lengthy answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> but it's, there's lots of aspects. I have 40 minutes today to talk about you know, something that I've been now thinking about for 10 years. And um, there's, I get excited every new discovery. Uh, there's, there seems to be no end yet. Okay, so um, there are a couple of questions online. Um, so first from uh, Lee Hong Liu. Uh, when did the uh, Guangzhou workshop start to make Persian blue, I mean, make using Persian blue? Um, some scholars in the uh, Palace Museum has also found this pigment in a group of reverse glass paintings produced at the beginning of the Chanlong's reign. Right, so, so the, my, my, yeah, my point about, well, we know the use of Prussian blue in China starts earlier, imported from Europe. And so, yes, in Qianlong, and I think there's some discussion about it even in Kangxi. Um, but what's, um, what sort of inspired me to begin to look was um, when do they begin to make it in China? And so we've discovered that we're still very early in, in sort of the research of Guangzhou uh, Prussian blue production, but we know in that first decade, we know that it's being brought into Canton we have uh, the ship's records, the manifest, that it's being brought into Canton, into the factory, the British factory in Canton, the last decade uh, of the 18th century, the 1790s. And at some point, they begin to introduce the, the process. Now, whether they reverse engineer it or whether the Europeans give them the formula, it's a very complex process to produce Prussian blue. It requires dis distilling with sulfuric acid and uh, it's a quite lengthy process. But blue as a pigment uh, has been in use throughout all of the, the world, indigo, cobalt, et cetera. The discovery of Prussian blue in the early 18th century, major discovery. Many people in this audience probably know that the most recent discovery of a new blue pigment was only a year ago. And that was the first time since Prussian blue had been discovered 300 years ago. And so, Finding blue pigments is, uh, and when you do, of course, you know, anybody who's in the print business is like, oh my gosh, I, this is a fantastic new color, I have to use it, let's, what can we do? Uh, and so these guys said, well, let's not just use it, let's 
you know, blow it out of the water. Okay, um, does anyone have any questions? I wonder um, about the kind of creative milieu in uh, around in Suzhou around the creation of this uh, map, and uh, I I kind of curious to know whether you know you have worked with maybe uh, I don't know scholars or um, curators in in Suzhou in China who have tried to discover whether remains of those wood blocks or uh, their workshops uh, etc. Yeah. Right. So. Uh Keep in mind, this discovery is six months old. So uh, virtually every place, um, it's still problematic for sort of field research. And um, uh, so we really haven't begun that process of, you know, what I'm providing today in many cases is sort of cutting edge research um, that we're in the process of. Uh, giving talks like this. You know, there will be someone in the audience who will reach out to me and say, hey, we've, you know, we've just started a study on whatever. Um, but I've, I've asked lots of different institutions to do pigment analysis. You know, I only have the, the data set from Harvard, which is uh, obviously a fairly reliable source, I think. Um, but I've asked Leiden and uh, Yokohama and all, all of these different places they still don't have the ability to bring outside people in. Not everyone has the luxury that Harvard does that it's all on campus. And you can just you know, pick it up and walk five minutes and then you've got this fantastic lab. Typically, you'd have to bring someone into the space. There's protocols, there's all kinds of things. So uh, we're still at sort of the front edge of uh, what uh, the production of these means historically and, and otherwise. It's an exciting time for this particular project. OK, so uh, we have many questions uh, in Zoom land. Um, this is from Kevin Carr. Uh, I'm an art historian and quite passionate about maps. But I have heard um, map scholars criticize uh, dilettantes like me for uh, doubling in cartographic history. What general advice do you have for art historians who like to study maps more deeply and integrate them into the broader histories of visual culture that they recount? Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, continue to do it no matter what other people tell you to do. These are historical documents and have as much uh, validity as anything else. Um, you know, I'm often, um, when I present this in a cartographic context, uh, the blue maps in particular, uh, I'm often asked the question, why isn't it more accurate? To which my response is, why is your assumption and preconceived notion so myopic? It is an extremely accurate map because it provides every single administrative body in the entire Qing realm. That's 1,800 administrative bodies. You can look at that. You can determine your communication system, the mail delivery system, your military outposts, your position. All of these things are provided in an instant. You know what your tax base is. You know where you should be getting revenue from. All of this is in a single image. So in terms of accuracy, it can't give you, it gives you, in fact, more information than something that is uh, from a European perspective, that is correct in, uh, in uh, from a, a, um, a geometric, uh, Euclidean methodology, triangulation, et cetera, presentation. Because it is abstracted, it doesn't require that two dots or four dots next to each other be in scale. It's an administrative map. It tells you a broader picture and gives you very specific information. So it's just a different way of thinking about space. And any map is just a two-dimensional depiction of the three-dimensional world. Keep that in mind. There is no better way. It's still something that's abstracted. You may assume that your phone is as accurate as it can be, 
but it's still two dimensions. It's a flat surface, thinking about the three-dimensional world and how you interact in that space. The difference between that and a sheet map is the material. But the, the way in which you think about it and process it visually and intellectually is exactly the same. There's nothing new about mapping that's in your phone. All of the things that happen every time you upload a new iOS and they change the font or they change the, the scale or they change the colors, that's been going on for thousands of years in map making. This is not innovative or new. It's just new if your timeline is five years. But put it in a historical context. So to go to your question, integrate maps into all of your art historical approach. Uh, the uh, knots you mentioned, this uh, American Curators of Asian Art, they've been listening to me for years talk about, look, you've got all these historical documents that are maps. The production methods are the same. There's an art historical. So I'm an art historian. So that's why I get excited about the production of these things. Integrate all of that into your teaching practice. Get people to think about maps in the same way that you do a woodblock print. There is no difference in terms of production. And you have very high production values. This is a, an extremely finely produced object, a complex process. This is not like you know, a throwaway map. You, know, you put it up, look at it one time, throw it away. No, this is, that has all of the artistic equivalents that you would for a, for a Chinese painting. OK, so next one is from uh, Rudy von Meister. Um, have you come across small scale, more portable versions in this blue? No, not, not in East Asia. It's already past one, but I guess we'll go a little bit, a few more yeah, questions. Until, you, until they kick us out. OK. <laughs> um, so next is from Rachel Saunders. Um, Rachel, yeah, um, thank you very much. To, for this talk. Uh, wonderful that this map is undergoing uh, treatment and uh, great to see images and collab collaborative findings from this. Is there any relationship to be found between these printed maps and blue and white ceramic wares bearing maps? Uh, and she sent me the, um, sent us the, um, the link, but you know, you know what that means. <laughs> so that's a, uh, it's, it's interesting that you asked that question. So what, what you're referring to is the uh, cobalt blue uh, the, um, produced in the Tempo period in Japan. So the 1830s, about the same time. Uh, blue maps, these uh, maps, these traditional um, uh, uh, type of maps are being produced in Arita ware ceramics uh, in Japan as part of the Arita kilns. There's a very famous fire. So the inner kilns, the outer kilns begin to look for new themes. And so um, do I think that there's a relationship between the two? Do I think so? Yes. Because in addition to that, so we have these maps being produced in China. We have the map plates being produced in Japan. In Korea, we have the introduction of uh, blue map making for the Yojido, uh, in particular, these atlases that are being created. And I think, um, whether consciously or not, as, as we all know, the 19th century is the beginning of uh, the process of thinking about nation states. And so this very early sense of identity of a people in a particular place uh, is universal throughout all of the world. And I see that simultaneously in East Asia, each tradition, China, Japan, and Korea, are each producing bl blue and white maps of their sphere of influence. And so in the case of the Japanese map plates, it's Japan, and there's a little bit of Ezo, and there's a little bit of Korea, and there's Ryukyu, and the island of women. So you have the integration uh, and the map itself is a kind of gyoki-style map, which is this traditional Japanese map. Uh, there's some question about um, whether these map plates begin as, as they um, progress through, through the 19th century. Um, the relationship of the West or Europe and the Americas and the pressure 
that begins to be applied as part of this identifying process. And so there is some uh, uh, debate about the, the reason for the production of these map plates. Is it about exactly that? Is, uh, is, is it creating an identity that looks to historical map making? In integrating some imaginary maps, those are just as valid as real maps and real place names. They're all part of the psyche of a nation state. Um, and then these Korean uh, atlases that start with a map of the world, the Chonhado, which is a unique, whole separate lecture for another day. Um, but you have a map of China, a map of Ryukyu, a map of Japan. You have a map of the Korean Peninsula. You have the eight provinces of Korea. You have uh, details of Seoul. These, are, these atlases are sets of 13. We happen to have in our collection a set of all of those maps, all printed in blue. So it's blue on white paper. That's it. So you have that same aesthetic, visual aesthetic, in all three cultures being produced simultaneously. So the answer to your question is, yes, I think there's a relationship. Do I have a direct correlation that I can like, put my finger on? No. But like you, I'm an art historian, and so this is what we do. We, we take the visual culture and we uh, you know, tease out the story that needs to be told. OK, so before uh, going to another question online, I wonder if you have any questions? Any? No? OK, so the next one is from uh, Molly uh, Briggs. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for this fascinating and detailed presentation. Uh, can you sum up, again, how your analysis of the map distills the intersection of material, technological, and social cultures? This is embedded in your presentation, but I'd love to hear you express this again. I'm here with my students at Illinois and simply delighted to have the opportunity to think about all this through the lenses of design, printing, and period vernaculars. So, um Thank you for your question, Molly, and I'm so glad you and your whole class tuned in. Uh, Molly came to see us two weeks ago. Um, she comes sort of as a printmaker first and is uh, uh, teaching at Urbana-Champaign now. Um, and so these very topics are things we were uh, talking about. Um, give me the question again. I mean, you want like an overview of everything I talked about? Yeah, I think so, the summary, yeah. A summary. Um, so, okay, so the blue maps are uh, produced in a, a unique way using considerations of the combination of the print production and the print mounting. Typically, these are two things in East Asia that are completely unrelated. An object is made, whether it's a manuscript, hand-painted, or printed, then it's sent to the mount maker, and the mount maker mounts it to uh, a paper backing, and whether it's a hand scroll or, or a hanging scroll, um, uh, that process is completely unrelated. In this process, they've conjoined the two in a very unique way. And I think part of the reason that in Japan, so when it leaves a Chinese context, even if it's right after it's printed, and goes to Japan, no mount maker ever would consider altering the original. I mean, it's just absurd. So when it arrives with those title slips, they don't even think, oh, oh, obviously I should trim these off and you know, put them on the outside of the scroll. They just integrate it into the final product. That's why it's in every Japanese format, because in Japan, it's in a different context. It's not it's in, in its an original production. Uh, so that's that aspect. The fact that we're using Prussian blue, new, uh, that's an exciting innovation. And the fact that it's produced a positive as a positive in this manner is just simply unheard of in production in East Asia. Uh, it's not to say that no one had ever thought of it before. I don't think that uh, you should consider this as something unique. It's a process that's been involved in, in making rubbings in traditional China since steelies were made, so since the, you know, the Wei period, uh, I think even Han period, we have steelies where you would go and you'd make a rubbing of it, you take it back, you collect it, you study it, you integrate it, you talk about it, you write poetry about it, uh, you do all of this uh, sort of creative processes. Um, so this blue map also integrates that 
And we know that through, in the celestial map, the introduction of three different typographies. And this goes right to what Molly and her class are thinking about. Three different styles of writing integrated into a single object is very unusual within an East Asian context. Two, yes. But three is somebody who's really thinking about calligraphy in a way that only a collector or someone who's deeply involved in writing and practicing and looking at and studying all of the different options. It's not to say that there are only three styles. In clerical script, you've got large script and small script and all of these different, they're, they're sort of subsets. Uh, we, don't, we didn't even talk about running scripts, uh, the sao shu, the, the grass scripts, all of these other options. But in this case, these are three styles that are historically uh, represented in stone specifically. And so those have been integrated. That's, that's my wrap up. Uh, glad, I hope the class enjoyed it. And you guys should reach out to me and we can do a Zoom anytime you like. <laughs> okay, so the next one is from Ashley Kanner. Um, what do you think the significance- Our intern. Oh, okay. <laughs> The significance is of all of the big blue maps is to the single black map besides uh, color production. What, what do you, I'm not sure what she means by that. Um, what Ashley, do why don't you ask me these questions when I'm in the office? <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so the next question is from uh, Cecilio Cooper. Uh, you've described these maps as terrestrial and have also drawn connections to com complementary uh, celestial maps. Do you have thoughts on, your, uh, on how water is dis depicted on the maps versus land? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So you'll notice um, in the light blue waves on the terrestrial map that there's this kind of texturing pattern. Um, so this is really, in a Chinese context, you only really have a, a small window variety of these kinds of wave-like patterns, and these integrate something that I would call sort of classically Chinese. I mentioned these Japanese map plates, and actually there's two different ways of depicting waves uh, in those. There's the octopus style, and then there's the, I can't remember what the Japanese is, the blue wave style, and so they're completely different ways of considering wave uh, uh, visual uh, uh, tropes. And so uh, within a Japanese context, and this is in a ceramic context, um, you've got a greater variety, but with water depicted in maps, there's, it's, it's very much the same kind of patterning that you see uh, in depictions of water in landscape painting, this kind of uh, waved uh, technique to it. Okay, uh, next is from an uh, anonymous person. Uh, did Western uh, cartographers have access to this map to use as a source for their maps? So was there access to these? So, um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the map in Leiden uh, has been in Leiden since the, I think it's the, um, I can't think of, when is Siebold? Uh, so uh, there's a German uh, doctor who works for the Dutch East India Company. So the only, only place that had access to uh, Japan from the 1630s to the 1860s was Holland. And so the Dutch, Dutch East India Company, once a year, they sent uh, a ship there. Um, and so one of these, uh, a German doctor who was on the crew from Batavia, which is uh, today's uh, in Indonesia, uh, uh, Jakarta, um, took the trip was um, when the, the uh, officials that are associated, the Dutch officials are there in Nagasaki. Um, they once, they have one opportunity to go to Edo to meet uh, with officials there and they come back. Um, so twice there are two German doctors working for the Dutch East India Company who collect Japanese maps. It's illegal under penalty of death to export maps. So there has to be collusion of some kind with a Japanese source, which happens twice. 
Uh, we have uh, Engelbert um, uh, Kempfer uh, in the 1690s. He's the first to do it. He actually goes, gets to go twice, and he brings back a group of things. Those maps are in the British Library. Uh, the other group of maps from Siebold's in the 1860s, there's two groups. Part of them are in uh, uh, the British Library, and the other group is in Leiden. Um, but he actually collected a blue map that was in Japan. He had it mounted there, so the Leiden map you're looking at is actually a, a, a German doctor in Nagasaki has it mounted. We know he had it mounted because of the paper he used. It's the same paper that he used for mounting hanging scrolls that were there, etc. Uh, and so um, uh, we know, yes, they had access to these maps. What they did with that access, that I can't tell you. That's a, a story for another day. Yes, okay. we have a, a oh. question here. Thanks again for an amazing talk. It's so fascinating. I have lots of questions on pigment, but this is... Are, are these maps then precursors to um, the blueprint as it's developed in the West in the 1840s using a synthetic Prussian blue? Yeah, so yes, blueprints are Prussian blue. Uh, so it is the same blue pigment. Are they, well, I wouldn't necessarily draw that correlation, but uh, yeah, I mean, the, the world is, is beginning to uh, Obviously, they've been producing these for a long time, and uh, so access to the Prussian blue um, is happening universally. But I don't think, th there's no obviously direct relationship between what's happening with these maps and then the beginning of the production on a large scale of blueprints. And the amount of blue that's used in a blueprint, as you know, that's blue on a white field. So the amount of blue itself, I mean, you, you now, in a modern time, certainly in the 19th century, um, you have white on a blue ground as another option, but that's more expensive. Okay, so we have two more questions online. Um, this one is uh, from Li Hong again. So indigo blue seems to be very popular in Qin uh, visual material culture, including painting, uh, architecture, decorative arts, fashion, etc. Do you think it has any association with cosmology of the Manchus? Whoa, that's a, that's a big question. Um, so blue historically has, um, is used all over the world and is often associated with royal or imperial production. Um, typically it's an expensive material uh, traditionally and so the production requires uh, and a scale of um, funding uh, so, uh, the, would I necessarily associate it directly with Manchu identity? No. Uh, but the use of blue like this, so these are not, uh, officially produced maps. This is produced, this is not sanctioned by the Manchu government. These are privately produced in the city of Suzhou, very typical kind of thing. Suzhou scholars kind of have always done their own thing, independent, or in some cases in concert with um, imperial production. But I don't think that these were intentionally produced in blue as some kind of association with a, a larger uh, Manchu identity. Okay, um, here's the, it's, it's not a question, uh, but the, I guess, a comment from Rachel Saunders. Uh, it may also be interesting to consider the work of Ito Jakuchu, not suggesting a direct relationship, but this work, um, she has a link here, is also printed positive from positive, uh, we think, and is a kind of map. Jakuchu was also painting with Persian blue uh, in the 18th century. Uh, this information came from the lipid catalog from the National Gallery, Californium, uh, I believe. Thank you. Fantastic. That's exactly, Rachel, that's exactly what I'm hoping for with conversations like this, is to give it a broader context. Um, that's all great information. Thank you. Yeah. And that was the last question. So uh, thank you again, Richard. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for joining today.